like to have your hair stand on end? Do you like to feel your blood run cold? Hmm. <laughs> of course you do. Come along with me, then. Welcome to Spooky Times with Eric D. I am your host, Eric D. And tonight we are going to be talking about one of the most influential horror and mystery programs that has ever existed. But you may never have actually heard about it unless you happen to be a fan of old time radio shows. But this is a show called Inner Sanctum Mysteries, although I think most people just call it Inner Sanctum or The Inner Sanctum. But that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, and we're going to see how it influenced so many shows that came after, including Vampira's show, including Elvira's show, including most of your local TV show host, Sven Gulli, and all those kind of guys, Zachary, and uh, even Tales from the Crypt. So we're going to talk about how influential the show was and why it was that influential. But before we do, of course, I want to remind you to check out the show's webpage. That is SpookyAS.com. There you can find almost each and every episode, as well as links to our social media. We are at Spooky Times with Eric D on Instagram, and you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Spooky Times with Eric D. It all works out rather nicely. Then you can join the Patreon. If you're a true blue spookaroo, you're going to want to join the Patreon because there's all kinds of things that nobody else gets to see except for the Patreon supporters, and that includes some exclusive videos, and uh, pretty soon, some exclusive episodes. Those are coming. I've been talking about them for a long time. I've got a whole plan to put them into action, and uh, they're coming. I promise they're coming. And all kinds of other goodies that I can't talk about just yet, but, you know, anytime I go on a spooky field trip or something, I do a photo dump. I put those on there. I put the raw video of the videos that I put up on YouTube if I do, like, a special trip or, you know, some kind of video like that then I, you know, you get to see all the footage, not just what I actually put out there and edit and, you know, make look a little fancier than normal. You get to see all of it. So it's like, you know, you get to actually come along on the trip with us. Okay, so with all that out of the way, let's get into our episode about Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Now, we're going to be talking mostly about the radio program, but the truth is it began as a book series by Simon & Schuster. In the 1930s, Simon & Schuster Books created a new imprint entitled The Inner Sanctum. Although The Inner Sanctum books included serious dramas, published with blue covers, and romance, published with, of course, red covers, the series was best known for its mysteries, which were published with green covers, because green is the most mysterious of all colors. The first title published was I Am Jonathan Shrivener by Claude Houghton. The series had many authors over the years who went on to various amounts of fame, but the name that sticks out to me most is Gypsy Rose Lee, the burlesque performer turned author whose autobiography was eventually turned into the smash Broadway film musical Gypsy. But I digress. In the 1940s, the rights to license the name, The Inner Sanctum, as a mystery radio program were purchased by the Blue Network. And if you're like me, you're wondering what the hell the Blue Network was. Well, it's a little complicated, but it was an independent network on the Northeast radio stations until it was purchased by NBC. But they eventually were forced to break up some of their network due to litigation from the FCC charging that NBC and CBS were trying to create radio monopoly companies. So then they went independent again, but they were really kind of still owned by NBC. And then eventually they became the American Broadcasting Company, which we know today as ABC, which is now owned by Disney. Anyway, Simon & Schuster agreed to license the name The Inner Sanctum to the Blue Network on one condition. At the end of each broadcast, the program must promote the latest book published in the series. On January 7, 1941, the Inner Sanctum Mystery Radio Program premiered. Early episodes opened with the soon-to-be infamous Creaky Door. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is Raymond, your host. Well, come in, won't you? 
Yes, how are your spirits this evening? Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Our spirits are fine, too. Would you like to see them? Oh, it's no trouble at all. Now, um, which would you care to see first, the spirit or the body? The host for the first several years of Inner Sanctum, who introduced himself by the fear-inducing moniker of Raymond, was a longtime theater and radio actor named Raymond Edward Johnson. He was well-versed in tales of mystery, having appeared in several episodes of Arch Obler's Lights Out, which of course we covered on another episode of this program. Raymond had what was considered a unique style for the time. He was very tongue-in-cheek, and he would often make morbid jokes and puns, such as, Quiet now, no coffin. We have grave matters to uncover. Or, careful next time you ask your wife to pass the knife. She may do it. Right through you. As the show went on, he often added a slight giggle to his more sinister lines, making him sound like a madman who was, perhaps, (laughs) ready to crack. The creaking door which opened and closed the program was inspired by the door to the basement of the recording studio, which producer Hyman Brown noticed squeaked like hell. He thought it would be a good, creepy way to welcome the audience to the program, so he had the studio engineers set up the equipment in the basement and record the sound of the door. But, of course, on the day of the recording, there was a problem. The damn thing wasn't squeaking. While pondering what to do about this unforeseen turn of events, Hyman sat in a rusty old office chair that was being stored in the basement. When he turned in the chair, it produced a blood-curdling squeak. Just the sound he was looking for. The chair went on to have a second life as a sound prop and provided squeaks for many a program, until a well-intentioned yet ill-informed staffer innocently repaired and oiled the chair. Still, the inner sanctum had its signature sound, and Hyman Brown was so sure that his idea would work that he had the sound copyrighted. And it turns out he was right to do so. Radio historian John During said the Inner Sanctum's creaking door, quote, may have been the greatest opening signature device ever achieved. And many years after the fact, Stephen King would recall that, quote, nothing could have looked as horrible as that door sounded. In 1946, Inner Sanctum Mysteries' famous opening was referenced in a Bugs Bunny cartoon. In the animated short, Racketeer Rabbit, Bugs is looking for a place to rest for the night when he stumbles upon a run-down Victorian mansion. When he opens the door, it creaks, and Bugs says, Huh! Sounds like Inner Sanctum! Sound design was hugely important to the show. Naturally, it's a radio show after all. Even so, the Inner Sanctum routinely went above and beyond to create morbid soundscapes to set the right mood. It started with the creaking door, but just as important was the organ, played by Lou White. White was instructed by Hyman Brown to never play even a snippet of a real song. Instead, he was only to play doom chords, which would build up a growing sense of dread in listeners, and which could be brought to a climax with White playing a sting, or a sharp, abrasive musical note or chord, which would emphasize certain lines or bits of action. Of course, we are all well familiar with this style of melodramatic horror now, but this is the roots. This is where it came from. Hyman Brown took great pride in creating sound effects for the show as well. He was especially proud of his method of creating the sound of a human head being crushed. To achieve it, he used a small metal hammer to strike a melon. He was very proud of that. He talked about it for years and years after the fact. The stories featured on the show were melodramatic thrillers mixing horror and humor. There were stories of ghosts, murders, murder ghosts, man-eating gorillas, and revenge, to name just a few. I noticed that many of the episodes prominently featured cats. I'm guessing this has to do with their sometimes uncanny noises that they make, and also how fun and easy it is to attempt to impersonate their hisses, shrieks, and yowls. Over 500 episodes would be produced during the show's 11-year run. Out of those 500, about 200 of them can still be found very easily via a Google search. The audio quality is sometimes lacking, but most have held up serviceably well. 
I didn't listen to every single episode as I prepared for this program, but I did listen to over 20, and I found most of them quite enjoyable, with only a few duds in the selection. One that particularly stuck out to me was The Man from Yesterday, which is the very simple story of a killer gorilla who is capable of much more than his captors suspect. I love this one because the acting is often very hammy, notably in the male leads acting. You can't make friends with a gorilla. You can't compromise with the jungle. Uh, and the monstrous gorilla does indeed sound rather frightening. As you might well imagine, there are perhaps some not-so-subtle racial overtones to be found here in the gorilla and his charming of the white ingenue, but the story is still simple fun, King Kong writ small. I can easily hear the great Phil Hartman playing both the male lead and the gorilla. More memorable episodes include Terror by Night, which aired in 1945, and the less-than-faithful adaption of Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart, which aired in 1941. This one's particularly interesting because it stars Boris Karloff, and uh, he was actually kind of a season regular, a series regular in the first season, having starred in, like, more than 15 episodes. And uh, he'd pop up once and again sometime after that. But it had other memorable guests as well. Some of them include the great Bela Lugosi, Mary Astor, Helen Hayes, Peter Lorre, Paul Lucas, Claude Rains, Frank Sinatra, Orson Welles, The Exorcist is... The Exorcist is... is Mercedes McCambridge, Everett Sloan, Burgess Meredith, and Bewitched Agnes Moorhead. The program had many sponsors through the years, including Carter's Little Liver Pills, which were said to help with indigestion and headaches, but in a twist worthy of the inner sanctum, were eventually found to contain poisonous agents. For over 60 years, everybody has known that the name Carter's Little Liver Pills means gentle and efficient health. Beginning in 1945, Lipton Tea sponsored the series, pairing the show's host with the cheery commercial spokeswoman Mary Bennett, a.k.a. the Tea Lady. Her blithesome pitches for Lipton Tea contrasted sharply with the macabre themes of the show's stories. Uh, don't worry, before the night's over, the murderer may have his face lifted too. By a rope around his neck. <laughs> oh, I'm terribly sorry for those two young people. Oh, Mary, you're always feeling sorry for our characters. Why don't you sing a different tune? Would you really like me to? Because I do know a different tune. I mean that new Lipton tea jingle. Like lots of folks, I've been hearing it on the radio this week, and, well, I'd kind of like to sing it myself. So... Won't you help me out there on the organ, please? Sing a song of Lipton, Lipton, T-E-A. Always brisk in flavor, B-R-I-S-K. Never wishy-washy, no, no, no siree. So sing a song of Lipton, then buy Lipton tea. Very, very good, Mary. Why, that's the first time I've felt like tapping my foot since I turned up my toes. <laughs> well, well, folks, I don't sing too well, but you'll admit that the song has a real catchy tune. She often admonished the host for his dark humor. About halfway through the program's run, host Raymond Johnson quit so that he could serve in the army during World War II. He was replaced by Paul McGrath, who did not keep the Raymond name, and he was known only as your host or Mr. Host. McGrath did keep the sardonic humor that the show was known for, however, but he was never quite able to equal the popularity of the show's original host. In 1952, with episode 526, The Dead Walk at Night, the show would come to an end. On the radio, anyway. Shortly after the radio program came to an end, Hyman Brown produced an Inner Sanctum television series, the half-hour anthology ran for only 39 episodes on NBC and featured Paul McGrath returning as the show's host, but he was never seen on screen. This is your host, ready to take you through that creaking door for spine-tingling inner sanctum mystery dramas. The show is not widely remembered. 
Now, I debated whether or not to include this next part about the films, the Inner Sanctum films, um, because it kind of doesn't relate to the radio show or, you know, uh, that we're talking about. But I guess it sort of does. It uses the same name, so let's learn about it. There were films. During the radio show's run, efforts were made to capitalize on the success of the program and the book series. So in June of 1943, Universal Pictures purchased the screen rights to the series from Simon & Schuster. So now, you know, this is a different company than who's making the radio show or the books, but they're all using the same banner, basically. You know, it'd be like if Marvel licensed out the use of the name Marvel and then other people you know, kind of started to make Marvel products, which I guess they do. But uh, anyway, they tapped Wolfman star Lon Chaney Jr. to star in a series of movies, and he was given creative input into the films as well. The first film in the series, Calling Dr. Death, was written by Edward Dine. Dine was forced to rewrite the script when Chaney demanded that the film have a narrator, just as the radio program had. So, with the exception of the final movie, Pillow of Death, each film begins with a sequence featuring the bobbing head of actor David Hoffman staring out of a crystal ball, warning audiences that they may, in fact, be sitting next to a murderer. It's not a great opening. Instead of a mysterious, mustachioed man in a smoking jacket bidding you to enter his creepy Victorian mansion, well, At least, that's what I envision when I listen to Raymond opening the radio program. We are instead greeted by a floating head and a crystal ball resting on what looks like a conference table in a rather unremarkable-looking office. And the intro was the same for every movie. Lon Chaney Jr. was hopeful for the series, craving some kind of diversity in his roles after Universal had placed him in various monster roles. Universal planned to produce two Inner Sanctum mystery films a year, each film featuring Cheney in the lead role. The films in the series include 1943's Calling Dr. Death, 1944's Weird Woman and Dead Man's Eyes, and 1945's The Frozen Ghost, Strange Confession, and Pillow of Death. The films are all murder mysteries and only one, Weird Women, even features a supernatural element. It also reunites Cheney with his Wolfman co-star Evelyn Ankers and his House of Frankenstein co-star Anne Gwynn, who, by the way, happens to be Chris Pine's grandmother. The authors of the book The Universal Horrors declared the Inner Sanctum films to be, quote, feeble melodramas with little to recommend beyond their camp qualities and morose spectacle of seeing a badly miscast Cheney struggling his way through acting assignments that were painfully beyond his depth. They concluded that the series was generally regarded by buffs and film historians as a missed cinematic opportunity. In 1974, Hyman Brown began producing a new radio mystery series for CBS called, appropriately enough, CBS Radio Mystery Theater. For this series, Brown recycled both the creaking door opening and, in some ways, the manner of Raymond, the host. The host this time was portrayed by E.G. Marshall until the show's final season in 1982, when the show was hosted by Tammy Grimes. The show was a success, and it was decided to re-air the 70s and 80s episodes in the late 90s. The stories themselves were usable, but since the host had made references to current events, it was decided to re-record the host segments and edit them into the old stories. So, who would Hyman Brown tap to play the host this time? Well, Brown himself re-recorded the host segments, and, as a tribute to the Inner Sanctum mystery and Raymond, Brown mimicked Raymond's... Good night. Pleasant dreams, huh? For the familiar closing. Hiram Brown lived a full life and passed away just about a month shy of what would have been his 100th birthday in 2010. As for the show's original host, as for the show's original host, Raymond, he never did return to the show, but he did go on to more work in radio after he got out of the army, including hosting a sci-fi show called Tales of Tomorrow. His career was struck short when he was diagnosed with MS, but he still enjoyed attending old-time radio conventions and reenacting his Inner Sanctum character for fans. He passed away in 2001 at the age 
of 90. And that is the story of the Inner Sanctum. And I have to say, as I was doing the research, and they talked about how it came back in the 70s and 80s, not the Inner Sanctum, but CBS Mysteries, and then they replayed them in the 90s, I was like, man, they were still doing, like, radio shows at that time? You know, I know it's become kind of a thing, you know, in in podcasting now, but I was kind of surprised. But then I remembered, when I was a little kid, uh, at midnight, the oldie station here in Boston, they used to play like some kind of horror show. Maybe it was this. Maybe, I don't know if they were a CBS station or not, but it was something along these lines. And I do remember being very frightened by one of those stories. They were talking about a lion escaping from a zoo and kind of, you know, going around a town and terrifying people. And they kind of presented it, you know, it was kind of presented world, War of the World style where it kind of sounded like it was happening in your area. And I was very afraid that I was going to look out my window and see a lion staring me down face to face. And of course, if you've listened to other episodes, you know that my older brother, Dan, he was right there ready to help me believe that, yeah, there probably is a lion outside. So that's a, a cherished childhood memory. Well, I certainly hope you enjoyed this episode. I think it's really fun to learn about these old time shows that, you know, us younger folk, even though I'm not all that young anymore, but uh, the, us younger folk didn't have any experience of and I can tell you, you know, most of the time I was sitting here researching something or maybe playing video games or, you know, doing something else, just kind of messing around the house. And I'd be listening to these Inner Sanctum episodes getting ready to record this episode. And uh, it really is, you know, they talk about theater of the mind and all that stuff. And you hear, you know, maybe your grandparents or great grandparents talk about, you know, I was, you know, you had to imagine things when you listen to the radio and it was so much scary. And even Stephen King kind of said, nothing can look as terrible as that door sounded. And uh, I think there's really something to that. You know, what you conjure up in your own imagination can be much more terrifying than, uh, you know, seeing even the coolest looking special effect in a movie, you know. So I think there's there's something to it and it's really enjoyable. And I encourage you to go find some of these episodes that are on they're in public domain, so I believe. So they're everywhere. They're all over the internet, and it's not hard to find. You can even find them on YouTube. Um, you can probably find them in podcast form if you want to listen to them. Again, sometimes the sound quality leaves a little something to be desired, so not the greatest for the car or something like that, but very enjoyable nonetheless, and I think if you're a fan of spooky things, you'll dig it. The only thing, it is one of those shows where there's usually a logical explanation at the end. You know, the monster is not real or the ghost isn't real but sometimes they are. Uh, a lot of times they're murder mysteries, but I'm always down for a good murder mystery too. So, you know, it just depends on what your bag is. But okay, that's all I've got to say about the Inner Sanctum. And I just want to again point you to the show's website. Website? No. Website. Spookyas.com. And, uh, you know, you can find all our contact information. Don't forget to follow us at Spooky Times with Eric D. That's our Instagram. And if you would be so kind, please consider joining the Patreon. When you join the Patreon, you not only get exclusives from the podcast, but also from the Witchfinder of Salem, because, of course, Spooky Times with Eric D is a Witchfinder production. So you can go to patreon.com slash witchfinder and join up, become a true blue spookaroo. I can't thank you enough for all of you who have already joined and stuck with me. Uh, I know I've been a little slow, a lot slow, in getting episodes out lately. Uh, and if you were on the Patreon, then you already uh, got a little explanation as to why that is. And if you haven't joined Patreon, but you want to find out why it is, well, there's a good reason to join. Um, this is going to kind of be the way of it. The episodes are going to come out now more like when I have time to do them, um, which is very uh, scant these days. Part of the reason I can't announce just yet, but I will be announcing soon. And of course, if you're on the Patreon, you'll be among the very first to know. It's good news. Um, so be happy about that. But that, my friends, will be the end of this episode. And until next time, don't be afraid.
And for anyone who'd like a snap course in exciting mystery reading, let me suggest this month's Inner Sanctum novel, The Murder of a Novelist, by Sally Wood. On sale at your favorite bookstore. <laughs> 